So actually at the beginning of the chapter there is where I want you to see the name of the sermon today is Suffer, Teach, and Protect the Little Children. And so the sermon today is going to be about little children. So when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. You know, that's why we sing that song. But I want to talk about children this morning. I want to talk about a couple things dealing with our children. But I first want you to see what Jesus thought of the little children. So when we look at Matthew chapter 18, in, in the very beginning of the chapter there, it talks about the fact that uh, there was children that were brought to Jesus, or that, that children were around him in a lot of cases. And I actually show you the place where it talks about suffer the little children. But in here, in, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, it says in verse 1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he's making an example out of little children as far as how you're going to get saved, first of all. But we also know that he's not just talking about salvation, although that is key. If you're going to get saved, you need to have the faith of a little child. You need to have that full trust, trusting faith. But also, you need to be obedient you need to be a servant, just like a child's a servant. So they're talking about being the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's how you be the greatest. But notice what it says in verse 5 there. It says, in verse, uh, verse 5, it says, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. So this is a big thing. Don't, t don't take this lightly. When you receive a little child, he's saying you're receiving him. And notice in verse 6 it says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Notice verse, verse 10. Verse 10 it says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little, little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. This is some strong language dealing with what God as far as how he, he deals with children and how we should deal with children. And why am I preaching on this? Because in most Baptist churches, as soon as you walk into the service, they're pointing your children to someone else. They're pointing them to some junior church. They're pointing them to some nursery. And immediately when you walk into the, the house of God, they're saying, get your children away from me. Get your children away and give them to someone else. Why are we what we call a family-integrated church? Because that's what Jesus wants. And you see how he said, if you receive a little child, in my name you receiveth me, Jesus said. And it says that, that you're not supposed to offend one of these, and you're not supposed to despise these. And you come into these churches a lot of times, and if a child makes a peep, it's like you just like, just broken the silence of, of time or something like that to where they just lose their minds. And, you know, it doesn't bother me. Honestly, I, I mean, in, in the case of children, you know, acting up and stuff like that, I'm probably uh, not as good as a pastor as far as maybe saying, hey, you should probably take them over to the, to the back or take them, you know, you know, try to calm them down or something like that because it doesn't bother me at all because, uh, I, I love the children being in the service, and the, ch and the children in the service is very, very important. Why do you think that the generation that's coming up today hates churches like this? They don't like hard preaching. They don't like Bible doctrine. They don't have the attention span to listen to the Bible. They don't have attention span, and, and they don't like authority, because after these children that are being, being brought up today weren't spanked as children. They weren't disciplined like they should be. But they weren't hearing a man of God preach the word of God boldly. They were in junior church, you know, singing some weird song about some underwater monster. And like, I don't even know these. I, I used to know these songs a little bit when you get on the, the, the bus routes and all this stuff and talking about all these, these weird things and weird creatures and all this stuff. But, you know, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's a song I love to sing. We sing to our children all the time. And guess what? We just sang it in the regular church service today. But those are the type of songs you want your children to grow up and, and think about. You don't want them to, to grow up and think, oh, church should be a playtime. Church should be a circus. 
Church should be a time where I'm just eating candy and, and just running around rampant and not hearing anything about the Word of God. And here's the thing. Most adults, are, uh, adults are going to be the ones that are going to probably grasp more what I'm saying now than children. But the children need to hear it more than you. The children, I, I confess today that I, I view the children, I mean, everybody has equal value, I believe, but I want them to hear it more than you. And I think every parent in here would say the same exact thing, that they'd rather their children grasp what I'm saying and what the Bible's teaching, what the pastor's saying, and that they would take that to heart and use that more than themselves. And so this is something that needs to be preached today. This is something that needs to be applied today. Why are we a family integrated church? Number one, because Jesus received the little children. And go to Matthew chapter 19. So there's places where the disciples were actually rebuking the fact that they're bringing children to Jesus. And I've even heard, I've been in Baptist churches where they would preach sermons about suffering the little children. And then they'd rip your face for not putting them in some junior church somewhere. Or putting them in the nursery. I'm like, that's... What in the world? I mean, like, when I think of this passage, I think of junior church. I think of them saying, you know, rebuke them. Send them to junior church. Send them to the nursery. And Jesus is saying, no. <laughs> you know, so, and so he's bringing them to, they're, they're bringing these children to Jesus. Matthew 19 and verse 13. Matthew 19, verse 13. It says, Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and his disciples rebuked them. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples because they rebuked these little children from coming to him. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. This is something that's brought up in Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke about suffering the little children. And why does it say suffer the little children? Because, obviously, it's going to be harder for them to be around. It's going to be harder for them to be in the church service because they're not going to sit up straight all the time. They're, all, they're not going to be quiet all the time. They're not like adults. Or they, don't, they don't know, but that's why they need to be in here. They need to learn to be that way. They need to deal with that, and we need to suffer it. The parents, you need to suffer it because it's going to be hard. And everybody else needs to suffer the children being there, even though they're not their children. Because that's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants them to be around the preaching. Jesus wants them to be in church with their family. And we're going to get to that point. There, there's, there's many points to this as far as why I believe this is the way it should be done. The why, we do it, why, why we do it the way we do it here. But in Mark chapter 10, verse 13, this is the same type of passage here, parallel passage. It says... And they brought young children to him, that he, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. Notice in this passage it says, He was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them. So Jesus, is all, he's, he was very displeased. He was much displeased that they did not let the children come unto him. And it says, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. And little children are a great example as far as how someone gets saved is the fact that they're humble and they, they have that trusting, that, that childlike trusting faith that they have in their parents, that their parents are going to take care of them, that they're, that they're going to be safe with their parents. That's the type of faith you need to have in God to be saved, is that it's all Jesus, it's not you at all, you have no uh, way to help yourself. And that's the way children are with their parents. When it comes to safety, they are, you are their safety. And if, you, if, they don't, if they can't see you, and I know with, my, with, with Clara, if she loses sight of, one, of, of me, Holly and I, mind is lost. Her mind is gone. She needs to find us. She'll lose her mind because her safety is gone. And that's what we need to have as far as God. If, if, we, if we think that God is, if we've lost you know, sight of God, we should be as scared just as much as a child is when they lose their parents. And so, but in Luke chapter 18, I want to show you the other passage here. Because you say, well, it's little children. 
it's, it's, and well, in this passage, it says young little children. So people will say, well, little children, you know, that could be like 10 years old, you know, nine years old. And, you know, but what about babies? You know, do we need the babies to be in here? Well, Luke chapter 18, notice what it says in verse 15. Luke 18, verse 15, it says, And they brought unto him also infants. Okay, so if you had any doubt that little children counted babies, infants. Okay, so we're dealing with newborns here. Infants. It says that, that he would touch them, but when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. So when he, they were bringing these children, they were bringing them from, like, you know, baby, you know, right out of the womb to, to children probably, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, whatever. And so... Uh, it says in, in verse 16, it says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So this is a big deal. Anytime the Bible repeats itself this many times, and, and if there's parallel passages in, in the Gospels, take note that that's important. And obviously everything in the Bible is important. But when it repeats itself, and especially if you see a ver something that's repeated itself in the same exact passage, take note that that's very important and God wants you to get that down, that he wants the children to be around him. And so when, we when it comes to church, obviously we believe that, that Christ meets with us here at the church, or else why are we here? And so, when it comes to the preaching, I believe, I believe that the, the Holy Spirit will, you know, fill me, you know, as long as I'm right with God and I'm preaching the right, you know, uh, right message and doctrine. But the children need to be here for that. The children need to hear the hard preaching. So, but why is this important? Well, we go out soul winning, and I think we were just out last week, and, and the, one of the things that someone said to me is, says, do you have a children's program? Do you have a children's program? Do you have something for the kids? Yeah, it's actually on that list. It's Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service, and, and Wednesday night service. And I got, and I got, a, I got, a, I got an activity for you. It's called soul winning. You know, everybody wants these activities and fun activities. Since when did church become playtime? Did you read Play Place Baptist Church when you, when you walked into the door? Church is a place to do work. Where do you see Jesus saying, hey, let's go, uh, let's go to the playground, let's go uh, just have fun? Now, I'm all for having fun, and there is a time for having fun, and we're going to have church activities, we're going to have things where we can have fun and, and kind of let loose as far as the work goes. But make no mistake about it, this church is about work. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry, that's just what it is. But most of these churches aren't. Most of these churches is about playtime, not only for the kids, but for also for the adults. Because they want to come to contemporary Baptist church. They want to come to where the rock band's at so they can come in and listen to their, their watered-down rock music with their breathy song leader that's probably a queer himself. And they, they want that type of entertainment. They want to be entertained. And I'm all, if, if I can entertain and give you the, the, the doctrines of the Bible and hard preaching, then amen. But I don't care if it's entertaining or not. The truth is the truth. And why do you think people hate the truth today? Why do you think the next generation that's coming up hates the truth? Because it wasn't taught them and they were just in some play place. You know, you can go down to McDonald's Baptist Church, but this is Outback Steakhouse Baptist Church. This is where you're going to get the strong meat of the word. And you know what? You may listen to a sermon and say, you know what? I, I didn't get all of that. And it's just too much to take in. Good. Good. You will eventually. Eventually you'll get it all. But I'm not going to preach. And here's the thing. You say, well, if you had the children in the church, they're not going to understand everything. Yeah, I know. But they will eventually. And when I preach, when I write my sermons, I write them to where I believe the top of the, the church would be. I'm not preaching to the bottom of the class. And so when I would preach at, uh, I did Sunday school classes when I was at Emmanuel before I got sent out. And I would, I would preach like I was preaching to adults. And sometimes, I mean, I think David was the only one that knew where I was at half the time. A lot of the kids that were in there were just completely lost. But here's the thing, and obviously I'd put some stuff on the really bottom of the shelf, but 
But there's things that David picked up. You know, he was eight years old, you know, when I was teaching the Sunday school class, and I would teach him stuff, and he would tell his parents, you know, th this st type of stuff that even adults don't understand. And so you would be surprised what children will pick up. You'll be surprised what they can understand. And guess what? If they understand at that young age, they'll remember it more than you will. And so the, at a young age is the best time to learn anything. L talk to anybody about learning uh, languages, learning anything like that. When it comes to learning it and remembering it, the best time is when you're young. And so I'm, I'm learning Greek right now just for fun and, uh, and to stop the mouths of the gainsayers, right, for the King James Bible. But uh, <laughs> it's a lot harder now. It was easier when I was in high school and I was learning Spanish. It was like, it just seemed to kind of stick with you and stuff like that. And, I, and it's, it's fun and I'm, I'm learning it and stuff like that. But you better believe that if I would have tried to learn it back when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, it would have been a lot easier. And so that's one big reason why you need to have your children in the church service. They're not going to understand everything. And obviously, a lot, of, a lot of the children in here are, you know, my children aren't even old enough to be saved yet. You know, they can't understand the gospel. But they will understand and know what it's like to be in a church, to sit, to try to learn to sit up straight, to, to not talk during the service, and to, to know what it's supposed to be like. They're not going to come out of a junior church when they're 10 or 12 years old and then try then to, to sit through a normal service. Why do you think half the time when they come out of junior church they can't behave? Not to mention that most of the kids that are coming out of junior church don't have their parents there. That's another point, another day. I'm not even getting into that as far as bringing children in without their parents. And then how in the world, you can't discipline them. And I'm all for spanking, but I'm not spanking other people's kids. You know, that's not my authority in realm. And so, uh, but that's another sermon. I'm not really getting into that. But when it comes to teaching our children, do you know who the number one person or people that it comes down to the teaching your children? The parents. The parents. It is your job to teach your children. Not only the Bible, but everything else. And so, uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So why are we a family integrated church? Because Jesus suffered the little children and he's commanding us to suffer the little children. Not to despise them, but to, to suffer them to be with us. But when it comes to teaching our children, and one of the big reasons, not only is it just the fact that every single time I talk to somebody about, uh, you know, they're going to some liberal church or something like that, they're like, oh, well, they got a good kids program. They have all this stuff. And, and, and it just baffles me that they're going to this church just because their kid, they want their kids to have, like, you know, playtime. But they themselves are anemic to the Word of God because they don't know any doctrine. They're not teaching anything that's worth any substance. And they may even be going to a church that preaches the right gospel. Well, but what's the point? Why don't you just stay home at that point? Why don't you just uh, stay home and read your Bible because you get more out of that than you would sitting in one of those dead play place churches. And so, I'm not advocating not going to church, but what I'm saying is, is that, honestly, when it comes to those churches, and especially a church that doesn't have the King James Bible, then you're wasting your time. Right. And all you're doing is training your children to not like hard preaching, to not like doctrine, and not be able to even handle it. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, and, and we're going to go to chapter 6 and chapter 11, but I want to talk about teaching our children. Because there was a big West Virginia teacher strike that was going on, and so this was on my mind. And, and everybody's posting about this stuff on, on Facebook, about how the teachers are striking, and we need to, you know, hopefully, you know, the, Cong you know, the, the state Senate and Congress will pass a bill to give them a raise and stuff like that. And I was telling them, like, I, I, Holly, I said, it's hard for me to care. It's hard for me to care because I'm not going to be sending my kids to the public school system, and I'm not going to, so we're going to be paying taxes for a public school system that I'm not using, so it's hard for me to really care about that. And so, but they're, they're constantly saying, well, what are you going to do without the public schools? Uh, have more money? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but anyway, I want to I talk about this because we're, we're homeschooling our children. We're going to, we're obviously, that starts at birth. You're schooling your children. But we haven't got to the point where you're like doing a cu curriculum or anything like that yet. But that's what we're, we're going to be doing. Uh, but Deuteronomy chapter 6. And verse 4, 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and, thine, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Now, you notice I was emphasizing thou. You know what thou is? It's a singular pronoun. So when you see ye or, or you, it's talking to a group of people. It's talking to plurality. But he's saying you, personally you, need to teach your children. And, and it's not just, you know, one part of the day. Because he's saying, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? All the time, it is your responsibility to teach your children. That flies in the face of public school system. That fl flies in the face of what most people would say today. You know, Hillary Clinton says it takes a village. Well, Hillary Clinton's going to burn in hell. That's what I have to say about that woman, the, the witch of Endor herself, you know, with her, her stupid, you know, book that she came out with and the fact that, that it takes a, a whole group of people to teach her children. Yeah, that's why our country is in the state that it's in. Because if it were up to the parents, majority, if the parents were teaching their children the Bible, if they were teaching them their mor morals and they were teaching them all that stuff, then there would be a lot, uh, a lot more of a better morality today than there, is, than there is now. But in Deuteronomy chapter 11, it repeats this. So again, now Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. That's what the word even means. And so in the second giving of the law, it says this twice. So again, when you see it twice in the Bible, in the same book, then it's probably an important thing to remember. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these words, these my words, in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontless between your eyes, and ye, sh and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the door posts of thine house, and upon thy gates, and your days, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, in the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers, unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. So, this is something that, when it comes definitely to the Bible, you need to be teaching your children. Now, when you come to church, the Bible says, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. So, blessed are they that read, blessed are those that hear. And so, obviously, you need to be reading your Bible, you need to be teaching your children, but they need to also be hearing it through preaching as well. Because that's another avenue that you're supposed to be learning the word of God. I'm supposed to be feeding the flock. Right? That's the, the job of the pastor is to feed the flock and to give you sound doctrine, hard preaching, and, but your parents, and, and parents out there, it is, is number one, your job to teach them the Bible. And so obviously when you come here, I, I look at preaching as, I don't want to say supplementary, because I do believe it's essential, but I believe the most important is that it's going on at home. It shouldn't be that when you come to church, that's the only time you hear about the Bible, your children hear about the Bible. And it definitely shouldn't be the case with you. And this is the case. In, in, in most uh, Christians' lives, they come to church, that's the only time they read the Bible, that's the only time they look at the Bible, and then they put it on the shelf until next Sunday. And that is just typical. So it's happening with, if that's happening with the adults, you know it's happening with the children. And so not only do you need to be reading it, studying it, and, and doing all this when, when thou sittest down, when thou risest up, you need to be doing that with your children. You need to be teaching them as often as you can. And so it's giving you every avenue of that. But even with disciplining your children, this isn't a sermon about discipline, but in Proverbs chapter 13, go to Proverbs chapter 13, and I'm sure eventually I'll do a whole sermon on raising, you know, raising children and nurturing and admonition of the Lord, 
Um, but this is more so just about suffering them in church, suffering them in general, you know, having children, teaching them, and we'll get into protecting them too. But in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Tell that to the liberals, because they always want to say, He that spareth the rod spoileth his child. No. It says, Hateth his son. If you don't spank your children, and you don't discipline them, like the Bible says, Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and he shall not die. Right? There, I'm not going into the whole sermon on this, but it says you hate, hate your child. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now that word betimes is a word we don't use that often anymore, but it just means early. Betimes just means early. And this is very crucial when it comes to disciplining your children because if you don't do it early, you're, you're going to be fighting a losing cause because the, the, the longer you wait to start disciplining your children, the harder it is to get them in subjection. And just as much as that, I believe this applies when it comes to teaching your children the Bible, teaching them anything, you need to do it early. Early. And, you know, we read the Bible, you know, and all that stuff to our kids. And, and you know, does Clara understand what I'm saying? Does she understand it? Probably not most of it. But it doesn't matter. The earlier, the better. And eventually she will. And she'll just be used to hearing it. And guess what? She'll know the voice of the shepherd. And she won't go astray. And notice, if you're in Proverbs 13, go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Because if you chase them betimes and you teach them betimes, that's when they're going to not depart from the way. Notice in verse 6. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So if it's going to be when he's old, that means that you were training him up when he was young. And so in this case with, with teaching your children, and, you know, when thou liest down, when thou sittest up, or risest up, I'm sorry, not sittest up, I, that'd be hard to do. Uh, when thou sittest down, when thou well, liest down, when thou risest up, you need to do it early. You need to do it early, you need to do it often, obviously, because it's talking about all these different times that you'd be doing it. And so this just, you know what this shows me is that this should be just your common vernacular. This should just be what you're talking about. And obviously you're not always going to be talking about the Bible, right? When you're saying, let's go to the, to the store and get some groceries, you're not, you don't need to quote a verse before you do that. But what I'm saying is, is that this should be something that's on your mind. You're talking about this here and there. And when, you're, when you see something happen or, or see, you know, you look at something, you, could, you can mention a Bible verse. You can mention something about God. And the way that you're going to do that as parents is that you know the Bible. And you know doctrine. And so the more you read the Bible, the more it's going to be on your mind. The more you memorize the Bible, definitely the more it's going to be on your mind. And so when you see things out in the world, you're automatically going to be thinking of Bible verses. You're going to be thinking about how that applies, or how this verse applies to that. Tell your children. You know, if something comes to mind and you're just saying, hey, you know what, the Bible says this. The Bible says that. And uh, you can even, like, even if you go to places where it says, like, um, uh, it, it has, like, a Bible name, like Mount Nebo, we, we pass Mount Nebo to go up to Pittsburgh or something like that, right? And you say, hey, that's in the Bible, you know, or, you know, and talk about the story or something like that, you know what I mean? So just things like that, where you're, wherever you're going, you're driving, you're, you go, you're traveling, you're doing something like that, uh, you're out having a picnic, and you can just talk about the grass withereth, the flower fadeth away, you know, falleth away, but the Lord of the Lord endureth forever. You know, anything like that. I'm just giving you examples and I'm not saying just to be a walking, quoting Bible and everything that you do, but it's just simple things like that. Kids are going to remember it. I remember when I was, uh, I was being, uh, we were really, we were young, but you remember Betsy. And uh, I found out later that she was a Baptist and, you know, she went to a Baptist church and all this stuff later on. Anyway, sweet old lady. And we still make her pancakes to this day. <laughs> so she had this pancake recipe. Anyway. I still remember to this day we were talking about being sick, and uh, and both you know both my parents worked at the hospital, so I already kind of knew about like medicine and stuff like that, and you take medicine if you're sick and stuff like that. And I said something to the effect of, you know, medicine will heal, you know, will help you and stuff like that. And I was really young, but I remember her saying, 
saying, you know, medicine, medicine can't help you without the Lord. And she mentioned God and saying that God is the reason that anybody would ever get better or that he would allow anybody to live or anything like that. You know, that stuck with me forever. Like, to this day, I remember her telling me that. And, but I was really young. And just stuff like that. But even, let, let's, say, let's say you're dealing with uh, just schooling, reading, writing, arithmetic. When I was in fifth grade, I had a horrible teacher, okay, that did not, she could not teach math, and she literally had someone else, like another teacher had time come in and teach math lessons because she didn't, she couldn't do it. We're talking fifth grade here. We're not talking calculus. We're not talking trigonometry or anything like that. We're talking, you know, fractions. Uh, and so, but I remember, I remember trying to do homework, and my dad had to teach me how to do fractions. He had to teach me how to do certain math. And obviously, once I started getting into a little more advanced, you know, that's where you get into the part where, hey, I haven't done that in a while. But when you're dealing with elementary type stuff, he taught me, you know, all those types of things, and it stuck. And so, the best things you're going to learn are the things that you learn at home with your parents and what they teach you. And so, uh, you know, when I think of my parents, there's, there's two things that I think of as far as what they taught me. My mom taught me perspective. If there's anything my mom taught me is perspective. She was a nurse. She, and so uh, anytime I would like feel bad about, I was short as a child. And, uh, you know, I grew like, I finally grew in like junior high, or in, uh, when I was a junior in high school. You know, so I was an ugly duckling for sure. So anyway, so I was short, couldn't play, you know, a lot of sports. I wrestled. That's all I could do, you know, short stature, you know, it's weight classes. So it worked out. But anyway, uh, when I would get sad about being short or, you know, being made fun of, she, <laughs> she'd just be like, well, let me take you to the cancer center and show you some kids that are dying of cancer. And I'm just like, okay, well, I guess I'm all right. So that type of stuff, though, you know, will give you perspective, right? Because when you think about it, yeah, I'm short, but I'm not, I have good health. You know, I have, I, both my parents are here. And you think about that type of stuff. Uh, my dad's twin brother passed away in 95, right? 95. And when, when that happened, that was perspective, right? That was perspective on the fact that, you know, my cousins no longer have a dad that's around, right? And so you had that type of perspective that keeps you in line and keeps you not worried about superficial things that don't matter. And, you know, my dad, if I were to say one thing that he taught me is not to be materialistic. And my dad, you know, gave us, you know, my parents gave me a lot of things. You know, I was very blessed. We weren't the richest family in the world, for sure. Uh, but when it came to if I ever did get something big, he would teach me that that was something that, that doesn't really matter. You know, that God, Jesus matters, you know, the Bible matters more than some dirt bike or some gun or something like that. And so, you know, those things stuck with me more than anything else going through school. You know, my parents staying together has, is, is what's going to help me stay married as, you know, as a, a father and a husband over here. Uh, and those type of things, uh, hard work, those type of things are what you need to teach your children. And they will not learn that in a public school. Well, let's talk about the public school for a second. Now, I came through public school. You know, all my brothers came through public school, and, you know, that's just what everybody did. You know, that's what, it was just like one of those things that that's what everybody was doing. And public school is only getting worse, okay? So uh, there's definitely some bad things that I can remember from, from public school as far as just what they taught. And later on, I had to kind of flush that stuff out of my mind. But nowadays, it's even worse. And think about this. It, it, when you send your kids to public school... They're there for seven or eight, day, eight hours a day. And so that's like a work week. You know, if you're thinking about working 40 hours a week, you're working eight hour days for five days. That's a lot of time that someone else is teaching your children. And think about when they come home, are you, are you doing a lot? Usually, you know, when I come home, I'm tired and I'm trying to play with my children. I'm trying to do this stuff. But it's hard to, to say like how much you're really getting to interact with your children because you're making them dinner, you're getting them ready for bed. And by the time, before you know it, before I blink, when I get home from work, my kids are in bed. And I'm going to bed. So, and so you got to think about that as far as who's teaching your children for those seven to eight hours a day in public school. And you got to think about what's being taught there. But 
I don't think most people even realize this. Do you know that a government public school is a communist idea? The Communist Manifesto, if you ever get a chance, read the Communist Manifesto. Plank number 10, free education for all children in public schools. Karl Marx. Think about that. Now, what's the number one? Get rid of private property. Oh, we've already done that. Now we got taxes on all our private property. And, and so we literally do live in a communist country to a certain extent. Now, we're not, we're not Russia and we're not com Red China. Okay, So obviously, we, there, there's different realms of communism and as far as you go into it. But to say that we're, not, or that we're completely capitalistic and we're completely autonomous from any type of socialism is ridiculous. Social security, right? That's in every single check that I get from my job, I have to look at the social security that's taken out, the social school system. So right off the cuff, that should tell you something that this isn't something that we should be buying into as far as the government school system. And so the government school system is, is a communist idea. And you say, well, the Bible, doesn't the Bible, you know, isn't it like communal? You know, when you think of the church in the New Testament, and all that stuff and how that was like a communist idea. And I'm tired of people talking about Jesus being a long-haired hippie communist. First of all, he didn't have long hair because it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Second of all, he did not teach communism. <laughs> so I want to talk about that for a second just so you don't think that all oh, the Bible's all for that. And so uh, in Proverbs chapter 5, I was talking about this when we were talking about marriage and you know having your own wife and not another. Uh, but in Proverbs chapter 5, the principle of being libertarian, so to speak, and you know, I'm not saying I'm a libertarian as far as the party because they go down some wicked paths as far as abortion and all that stuff. A true libertarian would be for all life, including those that are not born. But the idea of where the spirit is, there is liberty. You know, the Bible is very clear on this that God didn't have all these rules, like the rules that our government puts into place. They're not in here. If it was, this book would be a lot bigger. You know, God has rules, but they're not like that. They don't tell you where to eat, what you can eat, uh, what you can, you know. You know, it tells you not to drink, but it doesn't give a punishment for it. You know, besides the fact that you're going to ruin your life. But Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 says, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running, running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad in rivers and rivers of waters, in the streets, let them be only thine own and no strangers with thee. The idea of private property is definitely talked about in the Bible. And, it's not, and it never talks about, you know, uh, basically we all need to be communal and everything is everybody's. Uh, go to Acts chapter, and this is where they'll get this from. Because they'll go to Acts chapter 4 and at the end where it says everything, they had everything common. And I want to talk about this just for a second. Uh, just to prove to you because people are like, oh, you know, Jesus, Jesus, you know, when the church was all communistic and all this stuff. It's just stu stupidity. Um, but in, in verse, uh, verse 1 there, I wanted to see if, uh, where it says, yeah, I just want to show you where they would get that from. So in, in Acts chapter 4, in verse 32, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of things which, which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And so uh, they would like sell their lands and they would give it to the church and stuff like that. Now, that doesn't say, that wasn't a commandment for them to do that. First of all, it doesn't say sell, all, sell your stuff and give it to the church and then don't have any private property. Because there's a story that, that comes right after this. Because people were selling their lands and giving it to the apostles, and that's fine. You know, if you wanted to sell your land and give it to the church for the church's use, you know, as far as the money, you know, that's fine. But I'm not commanding you to do that. You know, I'm not telling you to sell your home, sell everything you have, and, and do that. But in notice, notice in verse 1 of chapter 5, this is Ananias and Sapphira. In verse 1 it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what it says here is that they, they sold, uh, 
certain certain land or certain possession here and they, they kept back a part of it. But what we'll find out is what they said was is that they gave it all to them. So it'd be like, let's say I sold something for $10,000, like I sold a car or something like that and I said, I sold this and I'm giving you everything that I got from it. But I kept $2,000 of that and I gave them $8,000. That is lying, right? Because I told them that I kept everything. Now notice what, what Peter says here. In verse 3 it says, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, what people will say is that he should have get the reason that, that, he, that he's in trouble here is because he didn't give it all. No, it's because he lied about it. Because he clarifies and says in verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So why, why, why did they die? So Ananias and Sapphira both die here. God kills them. Why? Because they lied about it. Not because they didn't give everything, and not because they could have just said, hey, we, we sold this, we're going to give you part of this. There wouldn't be anything wrong with that. They didn't have to sell it. But he's saying, when, when you sold it, was it not thine? And when... Uh, or when, you, when it was yours, was it not yours? And when you sold it, was it not in your own power to do what you will with it? So this whole idea of the fact that, you know, the church was like basically just, you know, they owned everything, that anybody that was a believer that was part of the church, it was, it was the churches. No. It was in each person's power to do with what they want with what they have. And so, the same, you know, this is more like an offering. But even tithes, I'm not coming to your door and saying, hey, where's your tithe? You know, give me that thou owest. <laughs> no, the, the thing is, is that that's all on you. You know, I'll preach about tithing and, and all that stuff. And obviously I did. I did a whole sermon on tithing. But, you know, I'm not like searching down people to see who's tithing, who's not tithing. That's between you and God. I'm going to tithe and, you know, that's what, what, what we need to do. But, uh, but in this case, Ananias and Sapphira both died because they lied to the Holy Ghost, not because they weren't communists enough right and so there's a lot of misconceptions with that but also think about this verse and and you can turn it if you want but second thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 it says for even when we are with you this we commanded you that if any would not work neither should he eat that flies in the face of socialism and communism because isn't that why we have the welfare state that we have today in west virginia and all the, the, the welfare state that's in the ghettos and all this stuff. We have government assistance because people won't work. Right. And all that government assistance is doing is, is, is just keeping people in that state of depending on the government. And the Bible says, though, if you don't work, neither should you eat. Because to get out of that system, you'd have to take a job where you'd be making less money than what the government would be giving you. You know, these, the, these liberals and a bunch of leftists that are out there that are saying, you know, oh, you don't care about the people in the inner city. No, I care about them. That's why I want them to get a job and start working instead of you keeping them, you know, just dependent on the government. But they want them to be dependent on the government because that's where they get their votes from and that's how they get in office. And that's how they make a living off of America because they make it off of the backs of those that are paying for those that aren't working. And eventually, in communism, there's no more to take. You know, you keep taking from people, there's going to eventually, you just, I don't have anything. Think of Joseph, what he did to the, the Egyptians. They, like, gave him their money, and they're like, well, I, you know, take our lands. You know, I don't have anything, any money, take our lands. Well, just take us, you know, we'll be your servants. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to that eventually they just want us to be their slaves. Why do you think they want gun control? Well... That's exactly what all these dictators and the communists want to do. Think of Stalin, how they took away their guns and they killed 8 million of their own people. And so you think, oh, that's crazy. That'll never happen. Have you read history? You know, I, I, I challenge you to read any history about communism and then come back to me and say that it will work. I read a book about the Bridget, Bridget Endow. It was, a, it was, it was uh, in 1956. That's not that long ago. This is after World War II because we had an ally of Russia that was a communist leader who killed way more people 
than than Hitler even that they even claim Hitler killed. That's another story for another day if you want to get into the Holocaust. But the the thing is is that Stalin is known to have killed way more people than any other dictator, besides Mao Zedong. But yet we were allies with them. After that, since we didn't go to war with them and we didn't decimate their whole civilization, they went out and started taking over other countries. They took over Hungary and it became a communist nation. You read that book. Read that book, The Bridge and Endow, and tell me that communism works. When they were taking people's parents and they would, they would torture them because they thought that they might be listening to some Western civilization radio about capitalism. And, and what they did, what the Red Army did to those people after they did revolt, and how they all came over and they, they fled over the Bridge of Vendow. That's why it's called the Bridge of Vendow. And, uh, and then you hear the stories out of their mouths. Eyewitness accounts of what communism was like in 1956. Then come to me and tell me that communism works and that we need to be a socialist states of America. Like Bernie Sanders wants. And so, but you know what? This isn't being taught in schools today. You have a public school system that's supposed to be teaching you history, but you know what? I never read about that. I never heard about that. You don't hear about Stalin and all the stuff you, you hear about that. You just hear that we're the good guys. We always do right. You know, when we carpet bomb nations and kill children and innocent people all day long, you don't hear about that. You don't hear about the battle at Dresden, you know, where they carpet bombed everybody in World War II and it was just civilians. You don't hear about that in the history books in, in you know, the public school system that you have today. No, they tell you what you, they want you to hear. And they program you what you want to hear. You know, I had to learn that, my, my, you know, I had to read that myself. And so, uh, just something to think about when you go into, into the public school system. What's their agenda? What's their end game? What are they trying to teach your children? I'll tell you what they're trying to teach your children. Humanism. They're trying to teach them the homosexual agenda, the sodomite agenda. They're trying to cram it down our throats as much as possible. The left-wing liberal agenda. Do you know in most states, and I think it might be in this state, where if you want to go to public schools, if you want your children to be in public schools, you have to vaccinate them. You have to vaccinate them to put them in public schools. Now, vaccination, that's another subject for another day. You know, if you vaccinate your children, I'm, I'm not against you. Uh, we we, we kind of have gone, you know, which ones would be worth taking the risk type of thing. Uh, but the fact that they would force you, and in, in California, they're just forcing everybody. You know, just mandating that you have to pump your kids full of a bunch of, you know, vaccinations that can... That, that on the label says can cause death, can cause all these type of problems, neurological problems. And... But yet, to be in public school, you have to, be, you have to vaccinate your, your children. And it would be, I think it's going to, it would be really hard, I think. And some people probably get around it and go through waivers and religious, you know, uh, exemptions and stuff like that. But good luck with that. But when you think about the public school, they took out prayer. They took out the fact that if you even bring up creation, you're laughed at in school. You can talk about any other religion. You can talk about Muhammad. You know, the guy that, uh, that, that married a six-year-old and consummated at nine. You can talk about that pedophile who's burning in hell right now. You can talk about that guy. But God forbid you talk about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. You don't think there's a push out there to try to destroy Christianity? Look at the Google, what is, what is it called, Lexus or Nexus? or What is, it, what is that thing called? Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. And this is multiple cases where someone bought one of these and they would say, who's Muhammad? And they would say, and it would say, you know, the, the great prophet Muhammad, you know, and all this stuff and, and talk about this stuff. And then you ask them why he married a six-year-old and they're like, oh, I don't know that. But you ask, you say, you say, uh, you know, who's the Lord Jesus Christ? And they don't say, he's a fictional character. Now, Muhammad's a great prophet of God. But Jesus Christ is a fictional character. There is a push today to get into the minds of your children. Hollywood, the TV, all the stuff that you see out there, all the billboards, all the commercials, 
the, the NFL, the NBA, all these things are just trying to get your children to just love wickedness, to love all this garbage they're trying to push. And think about this. It says in Psalm 9 and 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The public fool system has forgotten God. They not only forget God, they don't want to retain Him in their knowledge. You know what the Bible says? That even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Is it a big surprise to you that in the public school system, sodomy is pushed more than anything else? Now they have curriculums where you have to have some homo class and learn about sodomy and learn about transgender garbage. Now, we live in a wicked world today, and it's only getting worse. As the times get worse, we're getting more to the days of Noah, when the violence was filled, in, the earth was filled with violence, and that every imaginative of the heart was continu evil continually. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 4. Go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4. I want you to see this one. So why am I going to homeschool my children? Because I'm not going to send them into the den of lions. Man. I'm not going to send them to a den of iniquity, which is the public school system. Is it a big surprise to you that the teachers are all leftists? I mean, when you look at... Now, I had some good teachers, and I had some teachers that I really liked. I had a, I had a really good math teacher in high school who taught calculus, trig, and all that stuff. And she was a great teacher. When I got to college, when I got into engineering, my first calc class was a breeze. I'm like, this is cake. Everybody else is struggling. But I had already had calculus in high school, so I, I was like ahead of the curve. And I had some other teachers that were really good. I remember a foreign language teacher, Mrs. Smith, who taught Spanish. Great teacher. But it was Spanish, you know, and that's what she kept it as. It was just Spanish. She wasn't pushing any agenda. My math teacher wasn't pushing an agenda. She was just teaching math. But then I had some science classes where they had their agendas. And they had their, their evolution. And we watched some stupid film about how some plant mutated with another plant and became a plant that was the same type of plant. But somehow that was supposed to be a proof of evolution. And it was so, it was so ridiculous that it, he didn't say, like he wasn't coming out and saying, hey kids, you know, you should believe in evolution. This proves evolution. I watched it. I'm like, I don't, this is so boring. Like, wow, he grafted some plants together and they became the same type of plant, you know? And, but somehow that was supposed to like be, you know, proof for evolution. Anyway, so there was definitely wickedness in there. And there's, you know, so there's outliers. There's always outliers. You know, when you think of uh, fundamental Baptist from, there's always an outlier. There's always those Westboro Baptist churches that aren't like, you know, that everybody tries to link us in with that, that don't believe anything like we do, but people think we're like them. Uh, but when, when, in, in, in the, the, the school system, there's always going to be some teachers that are good, good people that really do want to teach your children right. So, but I have you at Pro Proverbs 28, right? Proverbs 28, verse 4, it says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. In the school system, that's all they're doing is praising the wicked. Why? Because they forsake the law. You know, they wouldn't dare talk about Leviticus 20.13 in school. Or Romans chapter 1, verse 32. They wouldn't dare talk about that. No, they praise queers. They praise transgenders. They praise these, these little boys that say they want to be little girls. Or little girls that say they want to be little boys. And you want to talk about child abuse today? They talk about spanking being child abuse. Child abuse is where you're having your, your little child have surgery to be another gender when they're not even old enough to even think for themselves. Right. That's wicked as hell. Those parents are going to burn the lowest hell for what they do to their children. Amen. And so the wickedness that's going on in the school is because they've forsaken the law. They've forsaken the law, therefore they praise the wicked. Anybody that praises a sodomite Anybody that praises an adulterer, anybody that praises a murderer, they're forsaking the law. No doubt about it. They're forsaking the law, and they're wicked. Go to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Because it's not like, if you went to the public school system and they just don't mention God, and they're just teaching reading, writing, math, you know, arithmetic, whatever, and they were just teaching those things, and they just kept their mouths shut when it came to philosophy and religion. 
You know, I could deal with that. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I still wouldn't send them. I'll tell you why, because I got another point, why I wouldn't send them there. But it wouldn't be that, it wouldn't be as bad because you'd be like, well, they're just learning the fundamentals of writing and reading, you know, like whatever. That, that makes sense. But that's not what their main agenda is. And that's not what they just teach over there. They have their, they want these children to grow up and be like them. They want them to have their ideas because they're like a mob. And they want the mob to rule. And so uh, Isaiah 5, verse 20, notice what it says. Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strong of strength to, to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous, the righteousness of the righteous from him. Talk about just reading a newspaper. These people call evil good and good evil. The Christians are evil. Those that say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, they're wicked. Isn't that what you hear today? The Christians, those people that want to have both their parents in the home and they want to teach their children themselves, you know, what wickedness. And, but this guy that wants to be a sodomite, man, give him, uh, you know, an award. Oh, guess what they did? Bruce Jenner, the queer that he is, got an award. He, he was woman of the year. Talk about feminism losing their, their ground, right? A man got the woman of the year. <laughs> Stupidity. Stupidity. Now you got nowadays, you know, I used to wrestle, and now there's like this transgender. When they say transgender, they're just the same. They're the man or a woman, and they just want to say there's something else. But there's this guy that says, I want to be a woman, and he's winning all these wrestling matches, beating up women. The number one enemy of feminism is feminism. It's hilarious. It's almost you just want to watch back and start eating some popcorn as they, as they just eat themselves, right? And, don't, and they do eat themselves. I mean, they don't, that's another sermon for another day, dealing with these, these queers. But, uh, but anyway, that's the type of stuff you're dealing with. People that call evil good and good evil, bittersweet and sweater, uh, sweet and bitter. And so it's, it's crazy how it's completely opposite. How the things that are right they deem as evil. And the things that are evil, they deem as completely right. Because they don't want you just to condone it and just say, you know, you can do what you want. They want you to say it's righteous. They are justifying the wicked and they're condemning the righteous. And that's exactly what the school systems are doing. That's what they're pushing. But you have the atheism, you have the evolution, pushing fornication, Pushing worldly music, all this worldly music that's on radio, first of all, it's horrible. I mean, every once in a while, like, you know, you'll be out there pumping gas and you listen to this stuff and you're just like, this is awful. This isn't even like tempting to the flesh. It's like listening. You either have some effeminate queer guy that's breathy and needs to like gird up his loins like a man, take off his skinny jeans and start putting on, you know, put some real britches on. Or you have some woman that's talking saying, hear me roar. And it's like some like, you know, butch type of song about women fighting and all this stuff. It's just like, it, first of all, that makes me sick. But on top of that, it doesn't even sound cool. It doesn't even sound catchy. You know, I'd rather listen to the Cat Stevens or something like that. And that's way back. That's before I was born. But, uh, you know, that type of stuff is appealing to the flesh because it's actually, you know, I don't know. So anyway, maybe I'm just getting old. You know, you know, they say when you get into your 30s, you start hating like the music of the day. You know, maybe that's what it is. But I have a feeling it's just awful. I think it's just, just horrible anyway. I mean, they just, they're not, they're not talented or anything like that. But, uh, but that music, I'm not even, don't even go into rap music because good night. That's all it is. It's just for, about fornication, about wickedness, about smut. And the same feminists that are all for like the feminist movement today, they're all just like, you know, all about rap music and love this rap music, dance to it and all this stuff. It's like, are you listening to what it says? And so the most degrading music to women is the music that's out there today. And you, I trust me, you do not want your children listening to this garbage. You don't want them to have this stuff in their head because some of it is catchy, even though I don't think so. <laughs> you know, they may think so, that it's catchy and they like it because it has a good beat to it and, and all this stuff. 
it's wicked and these schools are promoting it. These schools are all for it. They have plays, they have musicals, they have all these different things that are promoting a bunch of smut, a bunch of fornication, and I don't want my daughters in there. I don't want my daughters hearing all this garbage, and obviously they're going to be in the world, they're going to see stuff, but I don't want it seven or eight hours a day, five days a week. You know, I'd rather them be at home with mom, you know, learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic, which is what they should be learning, and hearing the Bible, and then when I go out soul with them, they can see it for what it is. They can see the drunk that comes to the door and see what alcohol is what, for what it is. They can see what it does to people's faces, the wickedness that they live in. You, they can see it for what it is. But, okay, so I need to get to my last point. I'm going to read a couple of verses for you before I get there because I'm running out of time. Going long. I'm always going long. Malachi, okay, so go to John chapter 10 because that's where I have the last point I want to get to. But Malachi, there's a couple of verses in there I just wanted to read. It says, Ye have wearied the Lord which, with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied, wearied him? When ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? Isn't that exactly what we see today? Is that everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. You know, these, these queers, you know, God loves them, and they're living for the Lord. There was just something in the paper. Uh, my brother sent me something where there's some Baptist church in Fairmont here, and it said some woman. Uh, they, I mean, they must have like a woman pastor. Well, there's strike one, having a woman pastor. I like to see that how she's a husband of one wife, but but she she was she openly says that she's for for homosexuals, and that Leviticus 20:13 is just talking about you know rape instances and not just that in general. And how all the churches were coming together. And there's some convention of Baptist church. I don't know. It's something weird. Anyway, they didn't call me up. <laughs> okay. They wouldn't want me at that meeting. And so, uh, anyway, they, they were all, like, you know, coming together to see if they're going to, you know, be for that and all that stuff. But it sounded like they were for it and they're, they were condoning of it. And so, talk about calling, you know, him to do it evil is good. So, uh, that, she's probably a sodomite herself. Who knows? But Malachi 3.15 says, and, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. What, what do they call queers? Because I, I, I don't say it from the pulpit. They call them gay. You know what gay means? Happy. What is the one big attribute uh, you know, that you would think of as far as the, the queers? Pride. They have gay pride parades and what are we calling we're calling the proud happy we're calling them gay it's like reading the newspaper when you read the bible here but in john chapter 10 this is what i want to get to so we're supposed to suffer the little children that means that you know obviously doing homeschooling is going to be work it's going to be work and here's the thing if you're going to homeschool your children homeschool your children what do i mean by that actually school your children. Just because you're saying you're homeschooling doesn't necessarily mean you're doing it. Okay? Some people just have their kids at home and they're like, oh, I'm homeschooling and you're just like playing around and not doing anything. No, you need to teach your children how to read. You need to teach them how to write. You need to teach them math. You need to teach them all this stuff. And so if they weren't getting that, I'm going to have to take them somewhere where they're going to get it. But, uh, and, and if you're going to teach your children, you may need to get some smarts. And you know the best place to start getting some smarts? Start reading the Bible. It makes the wise the simple. But you say, well, I'm not smart enough. So read the book before you teach it to them. Read about what you're going to teach them. You might actually learn something. And you know what? It's not going to be that hard because you've already gone through it before. And you're just going to be reminding yourself of what you need to teach them. But we not only need to suffer the little children, teach the little children, but we need to protect the little children. This is a big point today because we have a bunch of mass shootings that are going on in, in schools today. Do you think I'm going to send my little girls to that? To a gun-free zone with a bunch of people that, that, that aren't my relatives to look after my children and protect my children? No way. No way is that going to happen. John chapter 10, verse 11. I want, this is the main point. This goes into why we don't send children off to a junior church. Why I don't send them to a junior church. Why I don't I, if I wouldn't send my children to a junior church and I wouldn't put my children in a nursery, I'm not going to ask you to do it. Because that would be ridiculous to, to do that. But in John chapter 10, notice what it says in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the, the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. The one thing, if you're going to get anything out of this sermon, is that no one cares for your kids as much as you do. Period. And I'll say this, I, I, I love your kids, and I, and I would protect you. If someone came in here and tried to shoot up the place, you better believe they're getting, a, they're getting a bullet to their face before they ever get a round off. As much as I have power to do it, and I'm not the only one carrying in here, I know that. But that's not the point. Is Obviously, I'm the shepherd of the flock here. I'm not a, a hireling. I'm, I'm ordained as a shepherd of the flock, and I will protect everybody in here as much as possible as I can. But you better believe that even me, I'm going to be protecting my kids above all, right? I'm just going to be candid with you, and everybody I'm sure would say the exact same thing. That I'm going to make sure my family's safe. And that's the thing you got to think about. When you go and you put your kids into a daycare, you put them into a public school system, who's watching them? I have a policy, and, and it's a pretty strict one, that only my parents and Holly's parents watch our kids. Now, obviously, there might be a case where there's an emergency and we have to do something different. And, and it's not that I don't trust like some people. But, not, but you got to think about this. It's not even just as much that I trust the person, but do you want to put that responsibility on that person? Think about that. You know, uh, when it comes to even other family members that you'd say, well, I would trust them to take care of them, but do I want to put that burden on them to take care of them? But if it's outside of family... No. I'm not trusting my, my kids with other people. And that's just a hard line because obviously there's people that I would say, yeah, they, they be, I, I do trust them. But I make that hard line so that no one gets their feelings hurt <laughs> when they say, hey, can I watch your kids? Be like, no. But that's my policy, you know, is that my, only my parents and Holly's parents are going to watch them. And so, and, and so that's a hard line I take. But even more so when it comes to perfect strangers. When you, when you send them to a daycare or you send them to uh, into a public school system where it's perfect strangers, you don't know them from Adam. And I want you to know something. There are evil, wicked, reprobate people out there in the world. It's a fact. Just as much as there's psychopaths that will go into a school and shoot up innocent children, we know it to be true. We see it all the time that that is true. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. I just want you to get this down. To, we live in a wicked world, and we live in a world where these people exist. And you can't just put your head in the sand and say, I hope they don't exist anymore. That's what the left wants you to do. They want you to say, well, we want you to give up your guns, and hopefully everybody will give up their guns. No, it's not going to happen. Like, you take away the guns from, from the populace, all you're doing is taking them away from the good people. Not the, not the evil people that want to actually harm and hurt people. And so... Uh, and this isn't a sermon on guns, but I just want you to realize that we live in a wicked world where wicked people live. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14. Notice what it says. Proverbs 4, verse 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Notice what it says about these people. It says, For they sleep not except they do, that they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. You know there's people out there that can't even sleep unless they hurt somebody. They can't even sleep unless they cause mischief. That is their sole prerogative of life. And I'm talking about those that are twice dead, plucked up by the roots. I'm talking about those that are reprobate. Those people are in the world. There are psychopaths. There are people that are past feeling. There are people that don't have natural affection. And their, their sole prerogative is to hurt somebody. And mostly, they're hurting the innocent. Mostly, they're hurting those that can't protect themselves. And as a pastor, it's my job to protect the flock from that. That's why we don't have a nursery. That's why we don't have a junior church, because I can't see it. And if anybody goes into the, to the we call it the mother-baby room, 
You need to be back there with your children. Like some, one of the parents needs to be with their children. Don't just throw your children back there, okay? And, I, and I'm not saying that, you know, you know, my wife would never do anything. She would, you know, try to take care of them and all that stuff if, if, if that was the case that it happened. But all I'm saying is don't let your kids out of your sight. Protect your kids because as much as I hope that there wouldn't be some, you know, wicked, evil person like that in this church, you never know and it could definitely happen. And go to Acts chapter 20 just to prove to you that that could happen. Acts chapter 20 and I'm going to read Proverbs 3. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. He says, I, I've told you even weeping. I've told you often, even weeping. He talks about how these people keep, keep coming in, creeping in, and they're evil workers, they're dogs. He says, I've told you this before. This isn't grievous for me to tell you this again, because for you it is safe. Beware of these people. But Acts chapter 20, verse 28, notice what it says. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, all the flock, all the flock. And in the Baptist churches today, and the churches today, they want to take out that all. All the flocks means every man, woman, child, suckling, infant. I want to take heed for all the flock. I want to watch over all the flock if I can. And the best way is if everybody's here. Everybody's right in sight. If someone came in, you know, they're all here, and I know who I'm going to take out. But it says, Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, taking the oversight thereof, not, not you know, willingly. You know, and it talks about feeding the flock. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone, everyone night and day with tears. Paul the Apostle said to these churches, he says, they're going to come in. They're going to come in and they're going to try to speak perverse things and draw people away. And he says to beware of these dogs. And we know that a dog is what? A reprobate, but in, in particular, it says a sodomite. They're coming after your children. They're coming after the unstable souls. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to make a point here that this is something he talks about, but it was going on then. It's going to go on today, and it's always going to be this way. That there's going to be people that are going to creep in unawares. There are going to be people that are going to be spots in your feasts of charity. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, But these as brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. These are people eating with you, they're around you. Notice what it says in verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. We're talking about reprobates. We're talking about people that are going to feast with you. There's spots in your feast of charity, meaning that these people are going to come among you. And I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not out there on a witch hunt trying to find out who these people are. But I'm not going to be naive either to think that it will never happen. In the moment, if I ever found out someone was a sodomite, they're going through that door. Man. And they better just hope the door's not locked when I throw them through the door. And so any pedophile, you know, there, there's churches nowadays, and it baffles me that someone would ever have a pedophile in a Baptist church. Man. That knowingly that that person was a pedophile, that they would allow them into this church, or allow them into any church where there's children. It's baffling to me. Pedophiles have no love for me. They should just do us all a favor and just, just end it. Because they're all damned to hell anyway. Because they're reprobate. But these people are those that feast with you. And it says, there were false prophets among them, and even as there shall be false teachers among you. Just know that to be true. There are evil people out there. Now this isn't the, the majority of people out there, so don't go be like, you know, like half the people you run into are like these wicked people that just want people to fall. But I want you to know that they do exist. With that in mind, do you want to trust your children with a hireling? Do you want to trust your children with a stranger? 
Do you want to trust your children with anybody that wouldn't lay down their life for them? My parents would lay down their lives for Clara and Anna. No doubt in my mind. And same with Holly's parents. And you better believe I would because I'm not a hireling. I'm their parent. I'm their father. So we need to suffer the little children. Go to Psalm 127. This is where we're going to close. Psalm 127. It says, or, uh, we need to suffer the little children. Jesus suffered them. He suffered them to be among him. So we're going to suffer the little children to be in church with us. We're not sending them off to the play place and to some place where they can just romp and play. And, and, you know, that would be the least of my worries that they were just playing. I don't want to ever hear about a child being molested or injured or hurt by somebody. And I don't want to ever be in that situation where it was my fault because that happened. I, I don't think I could live with myself if something like that happened. And so that's why we, we have a family integrated church with the parents here. We're all, I'm all for busing in people. But I'm not busting in children without parents. And, and, I'm, and, and churches that do that, and, I, and, and hear me out, kids get saved when you bring them in the church like that. But I'm not going to, the, the, the ends don't justify the means in my case, and I, I can't do it. And I, as much as I want to see kids saved, we just need to get to the parents and, let, and ask the parents if we can give them the gospel, you know, and, and just do it the right way. Uh, I'm not going to take that into my hands to where I have these kids and they're all my responsibility at that time. If anything happens to them, it's on me and on anybody that's in here. And so I'm not going to ever do that. And so we need to teach them. We need to suffer them. We need to teach them. So I believe that goes just, not with just the Bible, but also with just all things. We need to teach them how to read, write, arithmetic. And we also need to protect them. And if there's any big point out of this, that's one of the biggest. <coughs> Why do I have them in the church service? To protect them. Why, why, you know, why won't I allow my kids to go to a daycare or to a, a school system? Because I want to protect them. Those, that's, a, that's one of the main reasons. Not, obviously, I don't want them to be brainwashed. I don't want them to have all this false doctrine in their head. But mostly, is I don't want them to get injured. I don't want them to be hurt. Because that is, you know, unreversible. Psalm 127. This is a very famous psalm. In verse 3 there. It says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I was actually talking to my friend, Brother Matt Stuckey, about this first because they just had a child. And, and, and up before that, I talked about how he's going to give them rest and all this stuff. And he's like, how is this true? Because I don't sleep <laughs> now that I have children. <laughs> I'm like, obviously, it's not talking about when they're little babies, okay? And so what I believe that's talking about is that, you know, we read Proverbs uh, 22, 6, where it says that train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When he is old. So I believe that these arrows in the hand of a mighty man, and they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. If you train your children up right, they'll be like an army towards you. And that's, when I think of my children, if I think about what I want to do in life, or my main prerogative is that my children are raised right, that my children love the Lord, obviously that they get saved, that they, they know the Lord, and that they'll answer the enemies in the gate. When, they, when they're old, they will not depart from it, because that was my main prerogative. If, if I thought my children were going to the wayside, I would step down as pastor. I'm just being candid with you. If I thought my children or my marriage was failing, my children were failing, then my house isn't in order and I'm not qualified to pastor. But if I thought that that was going by the wayside, that's more important to me. And obviously I can still serve God and I can still go soul winning. I can still go into a church and, and do what I need to do. And I'm not here to quit. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, he's just, you know, looking for an excuse to quit. I, I plan on staying with this till the day I die. I don't ever plan on quitting. But I want you to know where my priorities are. Obviously, God, you know, my wife, my children. But God, you know, being number one doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a pastor. That's where people, you know, they're like, oh, you have to be a pastor. You know, you know that I didn't really want to be a pastor? <laughs> you know, it's not like I desired it. Obviously, I desired the office of a bishop. Why did I desire it? Because it needed to be done. Because there's not churches like this in a lot of the areas that we go around. That soul winning isn't getting done. 
But if there was a plethora of these type of churches around, I would have been really happy just, you know, sitting in the pews, maybe preaching every once in a while, a sermon that was on my mind. And so I, I don't have to be a pastor. And it's not like I, don't, I have to be a pastor to serve God. My children are very important to me. Suffer them. Suffer your, and, I, and obviously I'll suffer your children. You know, where, the, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But where, you know, there's much increase, uh, increase by the strength of the ox. You know, people say, you know, all the kids are, you know, they're putting holes in the walls or, you know, making mess and all this other stuff. I don't care. I don't care. You know, I don't care if they mess up everything. Now, obviously, we need to train our children not to do that and take care of things, right? So I'm not saying to, like, you know, let them superman their way into the wall or something like that. But what I'm saying is that that is all superficial. That's all material. Who cares? Who cares? If they grow up and love the Lord and become a soul winner, and they, they're, they have a righteous family that they, they are rearing up, then it was worth it. All the plaster on the walls, all the stuff we had to clean on the carpets, it's all worth it in the end. That's the mindset you need to have with your children, is that, yes, it's work. Why would Jesus say, suffer the little children, if it wasn't work? Because that word implies that it's, it's, there's some suffering involved, right? That you're, you're, you're having to suffer the fact of that they're not going to be like having adults around, but it's very important. We're a family-integrated church. If we don't have a nursery. I believe in homeschooling because the parents are the best people to, to, to teach their children, and that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. And, you know, obviously, children that go to public school can come out right, but look at the statistics on how many do. Something to think about. I mean, obviously, I look at my brothers and I, and, I, and I'm not saying I'm like perfect or anything like that, but we came out all right, you know. But look at the statistics on people that came out right that are serving the Lord after they get out of public school. And you'll find out it's not very much. Or even that are saved <laughs> coming out of public school. Because all they do is get indoctrinated that God is a myth, that Jesus is a, is a fictional character, and that, you know, the Bible is a joke. That's what they're taught from a young age. And so something to think about. Suffer the little children. Let's suffer them. Let's teach them. And ultimately, we need to protect them. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. And I pray that you be with us as we uh, uh, have fellowship, but also as we uh, go out soul winning, Lord. We pray for, for that uh, time as well. And Lord, we just pray that you'd uh, bless us with more children. Lord, help us to teach our children and uh, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And help us to be the... The husbands, the fathers, the mothers, the daughters, the, the sons, you know, everything that you'd want us to be for you, Lord, and that we'd bring glory to your name. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.